Welcome to One on One with Expert Flyer. This is your host, Lisa Caslin. We're kicking off a unique air travel series today, and uh, our guest is David Ban Miller. He is a former airline CEO, among other things, and he has just written a book, his memoirs actually, called Turbulence. So we wanted to bring him on, have him talk a little bit about his book. And some of the things that are kind of floating around in the news relative to uh, travel this summer and, you know, how COVID might be affecting that or how we may be breaking away from it. So let me say hi to David. How are you? I'm very good, Lisa. Talking to you from sunny, believe it or not, Ireland, where the in addition <laughs> to the COVID crisis, the other mini crisis is that the pubs are still closed. And that oh, is boy. A serious. <laughs> situation as you can appreciate. That's a problem. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you're weathering the storm over there. So tell us a little bit about your very interesting career uh, with with multiple airlines and uh, maybe, you know, what what, what spurred you to to write this book now? Well, I started when I got out of college trying to figure out what to do and making sure. I went to Villanova undergrad uh, what I wanted to do with my life, and I wanted to see the world. Get away from home, go see the world. TWA came calling, and I signed up and started as a ticket agent in loading bags as well. So that background, uh, I said, in addition to seeing the world, I wanted to make sure that I could know everything there was to know about the industry. So over 50 years, I did every job that you could do, up the ranks, sideways, demotions, relocations, and ended up as CEO of multiple airlines, including Pan Am, Sun Country, Aloha, president of, of Air Calum. He sold that one to American. So a very broad career within an industry that I truly love. And I became uh-huh. frustrated over the years about many myths about air travel. Uh-huh. that People just don't understand how difficult, how complex, how actually cheap tickets are. And we can chat about some of the things that – I thought uh, you and the folks would be interested in from baggage fees to government ownership, uh, what agreements might look like, layoffs, furloughs, seating. You know, I'd like to Mm -hmm. chat about all that stuff. And the book was designed, it's sort of taken a left turn, I suppose. It was designed originally to discuss these myths, tell stories, talk about Mm -hmm. bankruptcies, talk about leadership, talk about some of the incredible experiences I've had in running operations in 70-some cities and 30-some countries around the world in my career. Yeah, and uh, you're you're known as the airline doctor, right? I got that name from one of the airline magazines in 19, and I guess 2006 it was, when I was bringing Aloha out of bankruptcy after I'd done two previous bankruptcies. I'm probably the only guy around that's everything from ticket agent to CEO of three airlines taken through bankruptcy. And so is there, is there a common thread um, among those airlines that, uh, you know, kind of took a wrong turn? Uh, do you see a similarity that they all made sort of the same mistake, or is it all over the map? All over the map. The, the, the first one, well, I, I was with Eric Callum. We took that public sold it to American. So that was a, and I started running Europe for American Airlines. So that was a great experience. I ended up at Pan Am when they merged with Carnival, and it was a lousy merger. Uh So the end result was I had to take the combination of those carriers through bankruptcy and sell it, and it was my first experience, and and quite a ride that was. And then Sun Country was after 9-11. So that Uh was surrounded by the drama and the economic impact of 9-11. Aloha was a bit different because Uh uh, when I got there, they they had no money, and uh, their heavy competitor was – Hawaiian and fuel escalating and probably some marketing emphasis that they lacked caused them to run into trouble. So I was running Air Jamaica at the time when I got the call that I want to come to Hawaii, and I thought that was a pretty good idea. I didn't know when I got there how bad it was going to be, but as Norm Mineta, who was Secretary of Transportation through part of my career and a good friend of mine, said, Dave, why do you take all these tough jobs? I said, I don't know. They keep calling and asking, and every time I do one, they ask for another one. I don't know. Wasn't my idea. <laughs> so how do you fix something like? I mean, obviously it would take you know days to, to answer that question, but 
um, you know, what what are some of the things that you do initially to troubleshoot uh, the core, the things that you had, the, the first steps that you have to take? Great question. All very similar. Let me use Aloha, the, the more recent example, and, and perhaps one that sort of emphasized an action that you have to take. It's kind of my first week discussion. First day, I show up and uh, you can't even mail the checks. There's no cash in the bank. So I knew we'd have to declare bankruptcy. So then the question is when? So the first week, first day, uh, I met with the unions, senior management, obviously the board, and the banks. And the banks we owe a lot of money to because we bought tickets with our credit card and they were furious. The union, of course, you've got to bring them on board. But most importantly, I cut senior management by 50% immediately. We had too many vice presidents. And you can't, in any reorganization, go to labor, go to leasing companies, go to banks, unless you've cleaned your own house. So that was my first step. Second was I closed a bunch of cities. Third was I renegotiated all of our labor agreements, uh, agreements with the banks. And then I started with the leasing companies to renegotiate those. Much of that process had to be done in the bankruptcy process, which gives you the latitude to hold up on paying for leases. And you can renegotiate all your agreements, labor agreements, as well as leases and uh, other obligations. Okay. So here we are now um, in a, you know, pretty dire uh state in terms of the the airline industry they i think they just they they got a 20 is it a 25 billion dollar bailouts i know some of yep. that is in loans right um so you know it, it's a lot of money um you know that that the taxpayers are are footing the bill for um how you know how, how does this affect uh, the airline's ability to bounce back. And do you think that the U.S. should have an ownership stake in these airlines? Well, I would take exception to the word bailout, for starters, okay. because it is not a bailout. The 08 problems with the banks was a bailout, self-imposed, arguably, irresponsible, arguably, this isn't a bailout. This is to try to salvage an industry that is 5% of the GDP in the country, directly and indirectly employs 10 million people, yeah. and is the lifeblood of virtually every community in America, if not the world. And when we talk about the $25 billion, let me give you an interesting statistic. I won't ask this question because very few people know the answer. The U.S. Industry, airline industry paid $25 billion dollars in taxes last year sound familiar that's the same as the care number yeah it's the same <laughs> they got their they got we, their money back <laughs> our 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 ticket prices include taxes that go as high as 20 percent and people never talk about it and when you take a look at at how airlines have operated over the years we hardly ever made money and last year we did okay, maybe nine or ten percent of revenues operating margin, but industry in general was fourteen percent. McDonald's was twenty five percent. Nobody can argues about the cost of a French fry, but they argue about a ticket. And one of the things that you had you and I had chatted about were, were things like baggage fees, and I'll get to that in a second. But back to the government ownership issue. Yeah. Uh, the answer is no, they should not be involved. They should not have an ownership position. And let me give you examples. First of all, the history of the aviation industry around the world, governments used to own airlines all over the world, Air France, British Airways. They were all you know, owned by the government. In the U.S., uh, before 78, the U.S. decided your fares, where you could fly, and that kind of thing. The fares now are dramatically cheaper than they were before because of deregulation, in the U.S., I mean, the average fare went from six hundred dollars in in two thousand to uh, four hundred dollars now. So people are hold on. So pe people are flying less expensively now. At Air Jamaica, the government had four board seats. It was a disaster. I couldn't get anything done. The politics were involved. We needed more money. The government wouldn't put it in, but they criticized the airline for political reasons. 
in California, before deregulation, we had the Public Utilities Commission that set fares and, and routes. And if you wanted to increase a fare, you applied to the PUC. They said yes, because you showed that you increased expenses by 5% on labor and marketing or whatever. And then you mm-hmm. got the increase. I mean, that was, that's no way to make it work. In yeah. today's world, and let me give you an, an unbelievable example just today. And it's going to be bigger. Government assistance worldwide right now is $123 billion. Not just the U.S. government, not our $25 billion alone, yeah. around the world. The South American governments were slow to assist the airlines. And guess what? The top two or three are now in bankruptcy. And hmm. that has its own implications. So I would say, and, and Lufthansa is another interesting example. Uh, they got uh, government loans and I don't know whether it's going to be debt, how, how you characterize it, but it's money, nine, $9 billion, uh, and they get a 20% ownership stake, which they want to get out of down the road. Uh-huh. And they say specifically two board seats, but they will not interfere with the operation of the airline. Well, I'm not so sure that's going to be true, but that's my opinion about government ownership. Bad idea. Government support for an industry that drives so much in way of our economy in the United States is critical. It's not a free lunch. It is not a bailout. The airlines have over the years done a phenomenal job at reducing CO2 emissions, improving safety. The safety yeah. performance of the airline industry is phenomenal. It's true. It's true. But I guess, you know, when when the rubber meets the road and, uh, you know, it's, it's in the minds of, of consumers, the taxpayers, um, you know, many feel that, you know, Hey, what am I getting out of this? You know, um, it, it, they're charging us left, right, and center for you know baggage and you know meals and this and that and the other. Um, should the airlines, you know, as an acknowledgement of of this, you know, give something back? Well, the the people that say you know I should get something for that are the same people that fly all the time. They want to fly safe on time, get their bag quickly, and fly as cheap as possible. I mean, that's the environment. Yeah. It's always been that environment. But mm-hmm. let's look at it this way. Let's talk about baggage fees. Some have said, well, you ought to waive the baggage fees. That's nonsense. Let me tell you why. When you add up the revenues that come in, what happened over the years is airlines said, well, wait a minute. Let's do like what Amazon does. You build up your basket. So you start with the cheapest fare possible, and you shouldn't pay the same as the guy next to you that has three bags, and you have one or none, he's eating, you're not eating, he's drinking, you're not drinking. He can buy a ticket through the computer six months in advance, so there's no labor. You know, bags cost money in terms of fuel burn, space on the airplane, and the labor to check in the bag. So why not differentiate between customers for that? It just seems fair and, and reasonable to just take baggage fees, pull it out and say, hey, forget the baggage fees. doesn't make any sense because... When an airplane flies from L.A. to New York, five hours just for fun, it costs X per hour to fly that airplane. Mm -hmm. And there's leases, fuel burn, overhead, landing fees, airport fees. The list goes on and on and on. And by the way, the unemployment at airports, airports, not airlines, airports, is dramatic. I mean, the furloughs and the reductions of thousands and thousands of people affected by this, not just airline employees, not just pilots. It's all that infrastructure that's getting slammed as well. So the government didn't just take care of the airline, but indirectly all those other folks. And when people talk about, well, the you know the the shareholders, shareholders are middle America. You know, they're they're not tit- titans of Wall Street. They're pension funds and so yeah. on. So so to say, I just let them all go into bankruptcy, which I've heard on CNBC, which is not something I enjoy hearing, well, let them all in bankruptcy. They really don't understand the mechanics of the business and how important it is. So that's my opinion, just one guy. Okay. But, I mean, still, there there are, and, and, you know, not to belabor the point of, you know, the a la carte pricing, but, you know, it just seems to be getting, you know, a little outrageous when you know when you when you when a family books uh, a flight and they have to pay extra to to sit together don't you think that that's a little much it depends if you're a single person flying or you're with a family you say if you're a family together and you want to sit together 
you pay a little bit more. When you speak about families, let me give you something that's going to really blow folks' minds. If you just look at the price index in 2000, it's kind of a measure of how prices have escalated over the years in various industries. And you, and you take a base of 100. The airline price index is 114. Movies is 120 is 160. The Magic Kingdom, the tickets to go to Magic Kingdom with your family in the past 20 years has gone up exponentially. Mm-hmm. Nobody seems to complain about that. They complain about, I'm going to pay $5 to sit with my family, and they spend another $200 with a family of four at Disney World from a couple of years ago, and nobody says anything. Well, it's, I guess it's one is entertainment and the other one's transportation. <laughs> you know? Well, but it's the same thing. It's the same dollars. It's the same transportation. It's the same holiday. It's the same stuff. And, and I revert back. Airlines have hardly ever made any money. I mean, they just haven't. It's a very expensive business. You know, an airplane costs between two and four hundred million. That's one airplane, and then you've that, got to pay for it. Purchase the, the the airplane. You mean? Yeah. If you, if you buy, a, I'll use a severe example, the A three eighty, which is kind of gone. Probably not going to fly much anymore. There was two hundred and some of them. But uh, that rack rate on that's four hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, regular A three twenty or a Boeing eight hundred depending upon how many you buy, is in the order of 100, 125, 150 million. And you have to pay for that. The capital intensity of this business is extraordinary. Plus it's labor intensive. So you have union agreements and so on. And the airfares, and this is the statistic reality, have gone from $600 average, including fees, from 1970, now it's 400. There is no dispute that fares have gone down, not up, and the ability to say to the consumer, you know, if you're good with the computer and you don't have to use our labor, you get a cheaper fare. And by the way, if you want a family of four or six and you want to sit together, you're going to deny somebody else a seat opportunity. So you just got to pay a little bit more. It just, when you look at it in the cold, hard light of day, it seems more reasonable. Now, I'm probably prejudiced. I'm going to accept that. But I think the pendulum has gone too far on the critical side of industry pricing as opposed to industry performance. It costs an awful lot of money to get you there safe with your bag. I guess I understand. I understand. Uh, I, I guess what, what we might be missing is, you know, something that they have in Europe that we still do not have, which is uh, an airline passenger's bill of rights. And I think that was – uh, Senator Blumenthal sponsored uh, a bill last year. I, I, I don't know what, what happened with that, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, if you get, and I'm going to be very blunt, if you get bureaucrats and politicians involved in airline pricing, that is so far out of their wheelhouse. Now, what they did in Europe, and Europe is a little bit more, I won't say socialistic, but it's sort of, the EU is a little bit more, Mm-hmm. Uh, that way. They just are mm-hmm. out of Brussels. So some of the actions that they put in were quite reasonable. Like if you delay a flight, X, you, you deserve some compensation. I, I don't take umbrage with that. What I do take umbrage with is if they get involved in the pricing aspect, where some politicians have said, hey, let's have a bill that says you can't charge any less than X or you can't have excess baggage fees. That's just to appeal to their electorate. That's all it is. It's nonsense. It makes no sense, and they don't belong in that arena. In terms of passenger rights, absolutely. If you remember when the jet blue meltdown happened a few years ago and LaGuardia was a mess, mm-hmm. and people were sitting on airplanes for three, four, five, six, eight hours. Yeah. They came, and I was there. I was on the board of the Air Transport Association at the time with JetBlue, American United, all the CEOs, on the board every quarter we meet, and we discuss that. And it was reasonable to say that's too much. Now, there's repercussions. If you're sitting out there on the tarmac for an hour and the clock is ticking, you say, wow, it's going to cost me $50,000, i will go back. Well, you might have gotten out in an hour and a half and people would be happy. So some of the decision-making that's involved in flight operations doesn't belong in a political bureaucratic environment. What's happened recently with the CARE Act, where they said, oh, by the way, we're going to loan you this money and these grants, but you got to mm-hmm. keep your schedule. 
So you can't stop flying out of Melbourne, Florida. Now, Melbourne, Florida is a very small yeah. airport. And right. when you're and dramatically cutting, where do you cut? So we've got a bureaucrat in Washington deciding your flight schedule, which is incredibly complex. You've got to be really smart to figure out how to schedule airplanes with slots, duty rigs, maintenance requirements, passenger demand, connections, code shares. All of that is so complex. Very complex. No, I, I, I get it. I now, get by it. the way, can we, can we, let's talk a little bit on this, because you probed me about this. What would a satisfactory agreement look like with, with government, yeah. whatever the context, okay? I just thought of a few interesting things that I would throw out, because it's, it has happened. The money's flowing. And what, what I would suggest, we had a discussion of warrants, and I think the warrants are in the arrangement. And that's not an awful thing because the taxpayer, in essence, gets the benefit if the airline improves, they have a slight sliver of, of ownership. That's what a warrant does. It's like for 10 years, I'm just going to give you an example. We used to do it when we leased airplanes. We'd say, hey, give me a better rate on the lease and I'll give you some warrants and you can buy the stock at X anytime over the next 10 years. So you got a bit of an upside. Low interest loans, which which they've done, grants, reduced taxes. In some cases, the taxes are, are really high. Uh, the uh, almost twenty percent airport rents. You know, a lot of the rents they pay. The airport pays it to the local authorities and government officials that represent the, the towns based upon their property values. And there's a big uproar now in England about the fact that Heathrow and Gatwick airports who pay an awful lot of money or in arrears on their rents to those airport authorities who in turn owe it to the local communities and city, city fathers. But the, the property values have tanked in all the airports. They're not for the next couple of years, their value has diminished because the revenue stream has almost disappeared. Now mm-hmm. I would also say, obviously the airlines should not pay dividends in this environment. They didn't, shouldn't do share backs. That, that's kind of, that's reasonable. I also mm-hmm. think, and this is out of the box, someday we need to ultimately privatize the FAA and manage it as a business. Now, the regulatory piece, where you basically monitor safety and performance and uh, how maintenance is done and that sort of thing, the FAA has that oversight from safety and compliance point of view. But operating the airports and the towers, you should privatize that. And another interesting fact, when everybody's talking about all this money, the millions of dollars and billions of dollars in taxes that went to the FAA to improve the air traffic control system has not happened. In today's sophisticated environment, we had two guys over the weekend fly to, you know, about 20 hours, they went up to the space station, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have a system now that guides airplanes to the maximum efficiency when they go from A to B. We're still using age-old techniques to fly an airplane across the country. When the sophisticated technology today can dramatically reduce the time to go from A to B and how you route airplanes. So what you're saying is if uh, if that was privatized, there would be no question. We would have the most sophisticated technology required. And and that's a safety concern. And quite frankly, yeah, the FAA would still have oversight. I mean, I wouldn't privatize oversight. That doesn't make any sense. But oh. it's like the CDC and it's like the medical boards. It's like all the sure. other associations around. But the actual operation of the business at all the airports, the infrastructure, that's the piece that should be privatized. Okay. And that's a big, that's a big number. And the ability to put those tax dollars to better use rather than go into the general fund, which sometimes mm-hmm. happens, kind of disappears in the Never Never Land, yeah. that we put that towards technology improvements that will reduce trip costs because you're going to reduce the flying time. Right now we go through vectors. So you go this vector to this vector to this vector. When you could fly safely and efficiently with good airplane separation in a more technology uh, efficient way than we do today. Fair enough. All right, so let's talk about what's happening uh, related to, to COVID. 
and what what your what your feeling is on on all of that. How do you how do you see the coronavirus uh, impacting the way people travel by air over the next several years? How is that going to play out in terms of you know changes that the airlines might might make um, burden on on passengers, et cetera? Well, there's no question that the world is different and will be different. After 9-11, we put in TSA and security procedures that now are pretty much the same around the world. And I would emphasize, ultimately, we need consistent protocols around the world for the processing of passengers. It's going to take a while. Whether you take their blood, whether you check their temperatures, everybody with masks is a part of TSA or separate will probably be part of TSA. And how you process the passengers is going to be different. The queues are going to be longer. Tempers are going to be shorter. And I tell the story from my ticket agent days as a gate agent. Gate agent is going to have a really hard time in the future because, like in the past, that family of four going to Disneyland, if it was delayed two hours, the father would be yelling at the gate agent, who is the one person that did not cause the delay, but they still yell at him. Yeah. And he's also the one person that's going to help you. So explain yeah. to me why you're yelling at the one person that's going to help mm-hmm. you. So. The environment at the airport is going to be challenging. Everybody needs to be kind of calm. The prices, I suspect, will be lower for a while just to stimulate traffic because it's been so decimated. And you need to somehow figure out a way to have flights at least cover their operating costs. So there's going to be a combination of keeping expenses down and uh, some fare stimulation. Uh, the airport process itself, as I said, is going to be different. On the airplane. Yeah. People need to understand and say, hey, let's take a third of the seats out. Well, <laughs> do you want to pay a third more for your ticket? No. Right. So, and, and by the way, you have to ask the question. Does it make any sense? Let me, let me give you an example. Air circulation is virtually as good as it is in an operating room. People don't believe that, but it's true. There's something mm-hmm. called the HIPAA filters. It's, it's basically how all that air is filtered through very intense, sophisticated filters on airplanes, which capture... of all particles rated that way by the CDC, rare exceptions over history of disease being spread on airplanes, and air circulates 10 to 20 times an hour through these sophisticated filters. So it's a lot safer than than people, safer than being on a train, I can tell you, or maybe even being at a restaurant. People certainly have to wear masks. I'm a very strong proponent. I hate them. But but they're going to have to wear masks. I think... You're going to see uh, business travel off, maybe Mm -hmm. a little bit for liability reasons. Hey, you you sent me to London and I get sick, so you've got to cover my problem. Or Zoom. I mean, Zoom has changed. I I do Zoom all the time now. And so some of that is going to be in our future. There's also going to be, and you're seeing it now in terms of layoffs and furloughs, which impact airport prices. If you're going to take, like Americans already chopped 100 airplanes out of their fleet of 1,000, and they're getting rid of older airplanes, which makes sense. 747s are pretty expensive. They're now older. 757s, you don't use many piles and flight attendants. So you're going to see furloughs, probably 30% Americans already announced uh, significant reductions. And my opinion is you start at the top with overhead and and senior management in terms of how many people do you really need and cut Mm -hmm. the overhead. Airplanes are going to be downsized, but I uh, and there's been just right now 11 bankruptcies around the world, and we've only started. 600 airplanes are grounded just by those 11 carriers. There's 16,000 airplanes grounded right now, so you're seeing voluntary layoffs, early terminations, job cuts, mm-hmm. and when the CARES Act says you can't get you can't furlough people or discharge them uh, before the end of September. And I can assure you that they're going to have to do that after because you can't take a production just like a factory and cut production by 10, 20, 30 percent and have mm-hmm. the same headcount. It just doesn't work. And it's it's very sad. And being in this industry for 50 years, it's quite troubling. I've never seen anything quite like it. I, I know. It, it really is uh, un, un, unprecedented. Do you think, I mean, it's it's just, it, it, you know, you were talking about the, the, the special HEPA filters and all of that. I mean, just simply, you know, the nature of flying, you're, you're literally on top of one another. So, I mean, social distancing really is not a possibility. I mean, unless 
you know, the the airlines decide to make some kind of, you know, crazy seating, uh, you know, traveling in tubes or something, and I I don't see that happening. Um, So, you know, in terms of we talked about the oversight, you know, I I guess each airline really uh, is in charge of uh, mandating and executing upon, you know, health and safety measures. There's there's really no consistency though, right across the board. I mean, yes, there there are there are you know agencies that, I guess ICAO like and others that you know will put forth recommendations, but the airlines themselves don't have to adhere to them, right? I think over time, and I'm a proponent of this, and I don't know about others in the industry, or my former colleagues, that. The FAA regulated smoking. You remember for years, I mean, you smoked on the airplane. It was, mm-hmm. it was unbelievable. And I, I wasn't a smoker, but I lived through all that. And uh, the FAA now has regulations, and you get fines or go to jail if you smoke in the laboratory, as an example. I think some of that should be required. And I think something like masks, something like yeah. health features, processing passengers, I, I don't. I have a problem with the government being involved in that sort of regulatory activity mm-hmm. because you need some level of consistency, common protocols to follow really around the world. You have to remember this is a new event. I mean, it doesn't take a day and a half to just change these things. It takes a long time, and sometimes common sense isn't followed, and then we catch up and common sense prevails. When we had 9-11, we weren't consistent. If you take a look at how we process passengers the day after 9-11. I mean, I lived through passenger processing from the 70s when people were hijacking airplanes on my shift in L.A. I mean, wow. when, when I was an airport manager, we had airplanes left and right being hijacked to Cuba. I had one of my, my first week on the job in LAX for TWA. A guy came in, had a gun and a cast, took an airplane to Rome, killed a couple people. So we've lived through all Good that. It took a while to go from magnetometers to sophisticated technology, better equipment. It's an evolution, and and we should not be expected to see it happen overnight, but I think your point is very well taken. We need consistency. We need stronger oversight on the protocols, and that consistency, I believe, personally, will happen. Example, you've got a co-chair relationship between Virgin Atlantic and Delta. Delta's got mm-hmm. 49%. He's, they're, they're in a couple of airlines, you know. So Delta will mandate a process for passengers as well as masks. Well, it needs to be consistent with their co-chair partner. And, and yeah. so that's why I think it's going to happen. When we have, you know, we rehearse accidents every six months. The industry sends out uh, internally an accident, and everybody goes to their uh, appointed place and desk to manage the hypothetical accident. When you have a co-chair partner, you rehearse those accidents with your co-chair partner. So I think you're going to see airlines getting together, if for no other reason, the consistency required for co-chairs. Yeah, that makes sense. Because it's got to be a seamless uh, experience. For the for Absolutely. the for the passengers, so yeah, that that in and of, in and of itself will kind of multiply the good behavior. I think so. I hope so. Look, yeah, look, I, you can't you can't get away from the fact that you can't social distance. Airlines are not going to reconfigure all their airplanes. I mean, no. we we fixed the doors after nine eleven, and that took about a year, year and a half, maybe two years yeah. to wow. design and put them in. To because when you put something on an airplane, you don't just put it in. You get FA requirements approval of drawings. It's a pretty sophisticated process to make any changes in the interior of that airplane. As an example, you know the masks that drop down from the ceiling? Mm-hmm. They they are geared to the to the 30, 31 inch pits, the seating configurations on the airplane. If you change oh. the seating of any size whatsoever, or can, you got to change the, the domino whole, effect. Top. Yes, it is. I understand. All right, so before I let you go, uh, what's what's your advice for you know the the next month if if people are you know uh, intrepid travelers and 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 they want to get on a plane is there anything that they they should know they should look out for? Well, I would I would be on an airplane tomorrow if the uh, situation warranted. 
However, here's an example of a problem. The UK government and some of the governments uh, like here in Ireland have said, if you fly in, you got to be quarantined for 14 days. So people aren't mm-hmm. going to fly. So obviously you're not going to come to the UK, Ireland, or some other places. If you've got to tell them I'm going to stay at the Ritz for 14 days, people just aren't going to tell you the truth. So that's going to have to get out of the way. And I say that because for the next couple of weeks, anybody traveling international, I would not do it until some of this nonsense is sorted out. Once that's accomplished, I would I would forward look at your travel vis-a-vis fares because there's going to be good deals out there for the mm-hmm. summer and into the fall and certainly into the winter. So I would not have any trepidation about a future-looking model if I'm the family of four who I want to go to Disneyland or, or another location Let's forward look and see what the fares are going to be like because it's going to be safe. It's, it's going to evolve. People will feel more comfortable. It won't be perfect for a long time, but people are going to fly, and there are opportunities out there. That's my suggestion. Well, I like that, and I like ending on a positive note. <laughs> Yes, Lisa. So I'm gonna ha- we're gonna have you back again, uh, maybe in a few weeks. Is that is that uh, sure. gonna work for you? Well, you're very kind. I enjoyed the conversation and happy to discuss these topics. Yeah, you're in very the interesting. Industry. We we appreciate you. We really do. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, you jo- you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Lisa. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye, David.